Well, welcome everybody. We are back at Kopsha Home down in South Bend, Indiana. And we're kind of shooting it from this distance because we have a whole gang uh, behind me from the History Museum. A lot of the folks that you've heard about and you've heard their names mentioned. And uh, you may even have had a chance to, uh, you know, get, them to, get to know them a little bit by going to their website. They've got some real fun profiles up with some fun pictures. Uh, characterizing who they are and kind of their, you know, their, you know, the, just, just the way they roll in a sense. So I'm going to start the class officially to get us going. And uh, with that, I also wanted to kind of jump into some things. You know, I know you all like to know the details, the history and everything. So, you know, as I was in Kopsha home for the first time the week leading up to Christmas, and Christy Dunn and Kat and others had shown me all those really awesome artifacts. And then we had come over to tour this incredible structure uh, that the Oliver family lived in. Uh, it just struck me that this was not, you know, this is not just a fancy place. It's not just a mansion, but this was somebody's home. And so I wanted to do a little bit of digging and give you guys some dates, I think, that are really neat. Uh, the one is that... Uh, J.D. Oliver, who you've heard me talk about a lot, uh, the, the farming magnet, the inventor, the industrialist that came up with the chilled plow that really revolutionized farming, uh, he was born right around 1850. And he and his wife, Anna Gertrude, moved into this incredible home around 1897. And uh, this was uh, J.D. Oliver's home for 36 years. Uh, and... Uh, he was about 47 years old when he moved into this home, if you can imagine, with his young family. And as I share with some of you, uh, you know, a lot of you sent me notes on my birthday back in January. And the discovery that I had that really struck me as, as, as cool and profound is that uh, Anna Gertrude's third child, uh, J.D. Oliver, and Anna, Anna Gertrude's uh, third child, Joseph Dottie Oliver Jr., was also born on January 14th. Which means when they moved into this home, he would have been right around five years old. Can you imagine moving into a house of this size when you're five? And I know when I was walking around with Skylar, she said, boys will be boys. You know, they would sometimes do fun things like they would jump out of the upper window and land on pillows and just do all kinds of fun stuff. So just like I share with all of you, we all had our presuppositions about museum people. You know, they're dry, they're not fun, they're not playful and all that kind of stuff which we have totally dispelled that myth. These are great warm folks and uh, they love what they do and they love getting involved, you know, with uh, building, building their mission. And we had a little piece in that. But uh, the real neat thing I think that I learned as well through this process, and uh, you heard me play it a couple of times on the premieres, uh, Scotland the Brave, was the significance of how that song uh, came about. And uh, the fact that it came about because of uh, a war that was going on. And the war specifically goes back to, and I've got a lot of notes here, so bear with me for a second. But the war goes all the way back to uh, right around 1854. And it was the Crimean War, when uh, the Scottish were having to Test gravity. The Scottish, Scottish were having to uh, defend their 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 turf, and uh, there was a large group of Russian uh, mounted soldiers on horses that ended up uh, challenging basically the the Scottish uh, soldiers that were trying to defend their homeland. And the result is the 93rd Highlanders had to face the Russian cavalry, which, which was quite a bit larger than they were. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of soldiers. And uh, it was against insurmountable odds. They were not, and they didn't anticipate prevailing. As a matter of fact, their leader had these encouraging words to say to them, stand your ground, boys, and prepare to die. And yet the result was, after these very brave Scottish uh, soldiers in kilts, uh, stood their ground and fired three volleys against the Russian mounted soldiers, the Russians retreated. 
So it just shows you sometimes you can face insurmountable odds. There's no sign of how is this going to work? How is it going to come together? How are we going to prevail? Kind of like this fundraiser that we did to, uh, to help out the History Museum. We didn't know where things were going when we started this. There were a lot of question marks. And yet the end result is, in just a short period of time, about two weeks, 10 days, uh, we raised over $10,000 and then even had another donation come in afterwards as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what I'd like to focus on right now is our friends that are behind me and patiently waiting for me to stop talking <laughs> so that uh, we can focus really where things should be focused. And that is on these Heroes for History, on these boards that really, really are the ones that made the difference for this campaign and helped us to achieve something that really is pretty doggone cool. So uh, with, Ke with uh, Brian's help and also, forgive me, Christy. Christy, with Brian's help and Christy's help, I'm going to read off the names again as I've done several times during premieres and acknowledge our Heroes for History and then Christy and uh, Brian are going to add one of their stickers from the History Museum just to kind of consecrate or consummate that, that you know, they, they recognize what you guys did. They recognize that many of you gave sacrificially. Some of you are jobless and you still saw the value of this mission. You saw the, the opportunity to step forward out of the shadows and to make a difference for these folks. Again, like Christy shared with me, Christy Dunn, back in December of last year, during the course of this pandemic, over 30% of museums across the nation have closed their doors permanently. And I know I shared that with you several times during this campaign, and many of you would reach out to me and say, that's not gonna happen on our watch. That's not gonna happen. We're a small army, but we're dedicated to this cause and we're gonna make something significant happen. And you certainly did that uh, for sure. So, so I'm gonna call off the names and with their help, we're gonna add stickers to all of your names to uh, recognize you as Heroes for History. And then I'm gonna play that song, uh, Scott, Scotland the Brave, and hopefully you hear it differently for the first time, recognizing that that song was written, the original music was written in 1911, and then finally there were lyrics put to it. And I can share those lyrics with you if I remember to do it during this premiere. But the lyrics really talk about the courage of these Scotsmen and the fact that they were facing an insurmountable force that they were, everyone thought they were going to lose. And yet they prevailed. So... Uh, I think that music will take on new meaning. We've all heard that song a million times. Uh, we've heard it uh, maybe on TV when there's funerals. We've heard it when there's been marching, you know, done by Scotsmen and they're dressed in their kilts and everything. But all of a sudden when you realize this song is talking about this battle and the fact that they faced a, a force that they were presumed, they, they were going to lose, no doubt about it. And yet they, uh, they ended up uh, stepping away victoriously. And their equivalent in Scotland of what we would call the Medal of Honor, that single event where those men, a couple hundred men, stood their ground against this huge force of these people on horseback. Uh, there were more uh, awards, the equivalent of the Medal of Honor, awarded during that and because of that event than any time in the history of Scotland. So it just gives you an idea of how significant this battle was, how significant uh, the courage of these Scotsmen were in uh, standing their ground. Okay. All right, so I'll start with the first one, Sonny from Pennsylvania. Uh, really a fantastic gal and uh, very involved with what we do here. And uh, Paula Noel from Florida. I can, actually go, I can actually go back and forth. That way we kind of go in and out. Uh, Roz from Michigan. This one right here. And also uh, Roz again uh, gave a donation, a second donation, in honor of Ernest E. Uh, Roos Jr. of Hobart, Indiana. And also uh, we're going to be donating that really cool postcard uh, from the 1900s in his name as well. Uh, let's see... Emma B. from Florida. Thank you again for that hero. Uh, Craig Edwards from uh, Pennsylvania.
Brian from Louisiana. <laughs> Different spelling though, yes, yes. <laughs> And uh, let's see, Butterfly on My Walls, Carol Jean from Texas. There you go. Thank you, Carol. Roz from Michigan. Juliet Thomas from Texas. She's right in the center there. Yay. Pamela Ann from Florida. I'm really testing Brian here. I'm kind of jumping all over the board. You know, love it. Uh, Mary from Washington State. Annette Stover from Texas. Uh, Super B, Mindy from Nevada. And uh, Super B, again, reached out to Shelby after the event, knowing that there's no prizes. I just want to support this great cause. So really a hero's hero. Uh, Tom Olson from Wisconsin. Down on the bottom there. Some dude, Thomas Jeffrey Hanks from California by way of Greece. Gloria Andrews from Georgia. Marion Singer, that still blows me away, the last name of Singer from Colorado. I had called out Colorado so many times, and she's finally said, okay, I'm sick of hearing you say Colorado didn't donate anything. <laughs> so they finally did. And Mary, again, from formerly from uh, Oregon, uh, she heard me calling out Oregon and saying, where's my Oregon people? And so she said, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> and who did we miss on this one? Did we miss anyone? Okay, Lori Mitchell, all the way to the bottom from uh, Mississippi. Perfect. All right. And I don't want to miss uh, Emily and Veronica from Texas. <laughs> I'm actually preparing a machine right now for, for Emily, who's a very young lady. I think she's around, and I don't want to say it wrong, Emily, so if I get it wrong, forgive me, okay? But she's quite young. She's, she's a teenager, and she struggles with autism. And her mom said she's, she, the, the pandemic and everything else has been so tough on their family. They've really had some dark days. And she said, all of a sudden we found this goofy dude from Wisconsin that does all kinds of silly things. And she said she just lit up. And then when she heard, up, heard that she could get a brick, she was like, Mom, I want a brick. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, very special folks down in Texas, Emily and Veronica. All right, who else am I missing? Did we get everybody on your board? Or we we still did. We said these two already. We can do them again. <laughs> did I, did I, did I, did we do Paul in the well? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Who do we have on your board, Brian? Doc Roger? Doc Roger? We can do Doc. Yeah, Louis, let's do Louis, Louis and Sandra from California. And uh, Doc, Doc Roger, Roger from New Mexico. Some Scott guy from Wisconsin, Scott. I don't know who that is. <laughs> he gets a sticker too, is he? <laughs> Champion of it all. And uh, John Smith from Florida. John Smith is a neat dude. He used to work for NASA and worked on their sewing machines where they made those big parachutes for uh, the shuttles and that. And then he also worked with sewing machines also on uh, a Navy vessel, a couple different Navy vessels. So he's a fun dude. Bill O'Rourke from Florida. And do we get everybody? That's everybody, I think. Okay. Perfect. So those are our heroes for history. Again, I mean, if you look at it, from all over the United States, but a relatively small army. And uh, they made a difference by just stepping forward out of the shadows and supporting a great cause. And I know that for everyone that I've, you know, I've gotten to know all these individuals quite well, they're not motivated by a brick. A brick is cool. They're not motivated even by getting one of my unicorn sewing machines. They're motivated by a great cause. And again, the, the significance of the cause that all of you supported is that the Singer plant that opened in the 1860s and closed in 1955 here in South Bend, at one point was supplying cabinets for about three quarters of the world. On average, they were making 10,000 cabinets a day, two million a year. So they touched every part of the world by their master craftsmanship that they made from that little factory campus here in South Bend, Indiana. I shouldn't say little, it's about 50 or 60 acres. But the fact is, you know, a group of 3,000 individuals 
were just buzzing like bees making these incredible cabinets. And I've shown them to you. They're, they're not a basic cabinet. They're really works of art. So South Bend has a proud history with that factory and just the way they were able to touch the entire world. And now you've been able to be a part of that in making sure that they can continue their mission. So, so with all that blah, blah, blahing, I'm going to play uh, Scotland the Brave just so you can hear it and hopefully hear it differently than you've heard it in the past, knowing the, the, the roots of that song being tied back to those incredibly brave Scotsmen. Again, when J.D. Oliver was a little boy about four years old, that's when these events would have unfolded uh, right around 1854. And then he grew up as a proud Scotsman from those roots and his family's roots as well, uh, probably hearing stories about those brave men that stood their ground against insurmountable odds and uh, pre prevailed victoriously. You know, on a much smaller scale and certainly with not death at stake, uh, all of you as Heroes for History did that as well. Many of you are being challenged by different things in your life right now. Some of you are battling cancer. Some of you are jobless. And yet you rallied for this cause. And, and I know that this incredible team uh, behind me and myself uh, are, are truly grateful. And they'll be able to share some of their thoughts on that and just the impact that you brought. But uh, let me see if I can figure out this gadget. Otherwise, I'll get somebody to help me figure out the gadget. We'll play that song. Because I really want you to, I really want to tie everything back to J.D. Oliver uh, and his Scottish roots. And this song is what everybody immediately recognized as significant to that great country. All right. So I, is it just a play button? Yeah, or? there's a play button. And okay. makes a difference when you can all of a sudden tie those events to that song, doesn't it? And it just makes you realize why the Scottish people and a Scotsman like J.D. Oliver would be so proud of that incredible history, right? Okay, well, at this point, what I'd like to do is invite any of the History Museum staff that want to share any remarks about the impact that all of you as Heroes for History brought to this event. Whatever they want to share, they can share. So uh, I'll kind of get behind the camera like I usually am and invite any of them to step out and share their thoughts on uh, this campaign. I'm happy to start with that. And Scott, uh, very thrilled that you were able to do this for us and for the entire group that is, uh, that is watching us. Uh, thank you. You heard the statistic that was mentioned that about a third of museums in the country have not uh, been able to 
reopen since this pandemic and may permanently stay closed. And I want to thank each of you for helping us to, to not be, to succumb to the statistic, for us to be able to be one of those museums that can actually stay open and continue to, to serve our, our mission of, of preserving history for future generations. We are the second oldest, second largest um, historical society in Indiana. We have a beautiful house museum in that uh, Kaupsha home that has been in, uh, in existence for 125 years with a museum that has surrounded that with seven galleries. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. The, the money that you are put contributing towards this in this difficult time helps us stay open and does help us to truly fulfill our mission. And so uh, I, I am amazed with the, with, the, with the feedback and certainly knowing Singer is a significant part of that and love that you, each of you are true champions for history and supporting us and supporting the Singer history. So thank you, Scott, and thank you, each one of you. My team has more things to say as well. So Thank you for sharing that, Brian. That's Absolutely. awesome. That's awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Christy Erickson. Um, I'm the Deputy Executive Director here. And um, I just want to say, you know, thank you to Scott. Thank you to all of you. It's people like you who really make it possible for us to do what we do. Um, I oversee our exhibits, our collections, um, and our education department. And like Brian said, we have seven exhibit galleries. We have half a million items in our collection. And our mission is really to bring that knowledge to the public and help people learn about places like Singer here in South Bend. And it wouldn't be um, possible without the help of uh, the people like you, people on this board, people like Scott. So we're just very grateful um, for everything that you do. So thank you so much. Anybody else want to share? Christy? Sorry to make you keep moving the camera. No, no, I've forward. got practice at this. I could do this. Hi, I'm Christy Dunn. I'm the registrar here. Um, you guys have heard about her a couple times. <laughs> I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for all the money that you've donated. There are many different areas in a museum that money goes to help towards. And one of them that I oversee is acquisitions, um, obtaining new artifacts. In our 150 years, most of our artifacts, most of our half million artifacts have been donated um, by the kindness of people. But every once in a while, there's something that pops up for sale or at auction, like um, a Singer sewing machine that really would fit our mission, fit our scope. And donations help us actually be able to acquire those items. So thank you so very much. Um, Really, I'm glad to know you all. Cool. That's Christy Dunn, you guys, the one I keep mentioning. <laughs> Kat! I'm just going to keep the pattern going. Once Wait, I should I call it. you Kat or Catherine? Are we doing Catherine? Kat's Catherine? great. Okay. Kat is great. I got to run the, I got I to gotta tell you guys this one. I called the museum one day. I don't remember why I was calling. Maybe I was making a crank call or something. Who knows? But I, all of a sudden, I hear this very dignified person answering on the other side. And she goes, yes, this is Catherine. And then she said her last name. I'm paused for a second. <laughs> Is that you, Kat? She said, yeah, I'm answering the phone. I'm being formal, so. Uh, yeah, guilty. Um, uh, like, like Christy said, you know, uh, what, you know money gifts to, to the museum go a long way in a lot of different ways. Um, and one of, the, one of the special ways that they can really help us is, you know, uh, as a museum, we're able to provide, you know, you know the, phys the facilities, like the, the physical housing to keep, to, uh, take care of our treasured artifacts and we're able to provide the staff, the knowledge, the expertise that we bring to keep track of these stories and the, the record keeping that keep all of those, that keep the life of that object intact with it in perpetuity. Um, but you know, your money, your gifts to us help us take, expand that power even further to be able to reach out to our colleagues in the field who are particular experts um, to uh, bring them in to help us keep those artifacts in the best, the best shape possible for the longest period of time. We're able to hire uh, conservators, uh, experts in preservation, uh, to help us keep those artifacts in great shape, uh, including um, we've been able to conserve some paintings over the years. Uh, a few years ago, we had conserved a wonderful embroidered sampler. Oh. Uh, that we still uh, bring out occasionally. Um, and uh, it's a true gift to be able to keep uh, sp special artifacts, uh, it, it give them the special care that they require. Uh, and we couldn't do that without your help. So thank you so much. 
Including oh. a grandfather clock that you've been <laughs> I love that clock. Also conserved. Yeah. We, we've got to stay here until noon so we can... No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I know you guys are all busy. But... Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Spencer Harding, and I'm a curatorial tech here at the museum. And a big part of my job deals with um, cataloging and housing new objects that we get. And we're, we're a museum that has a very diverse collection, which means we have a lot of smaller items. We have some larger items and everything in between. And I'm grateful for your donations because that allows us to buy more acid-free boxes to store items and special Ziploc bags that, that don't uh, deteriorate over time, as well as tissue paper and other materials that make my job a little bit easier and allow me to store our objects so that we can bring them out in the future and educate future generations about the past. So thank you very much, everybody. That's awesome. I didn't know you needed all those things. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Although when I went down to see Christy and Kat down in the, the, the room that we examined all the artifacts in, uh -huh. I, I just walk in there like, okay, I'm going to check these out, kind of like I'm in my workshop, and they go, oh, break's on, buddy. <laughs> put your gloves on, put your gloves on. So I was like, okay, all right, yes, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. So anybody else want to share any thoughts? Guys, this is Skylar. <laughs> for all the donations. So like Kat uh, mentioned earlier, we use those donations to help preserve artifacts and conserve them like paintings. Uh, we had a painting recently conserved that hadn't been hanging in the mansion for about 20 years. So to have donations like that helps us to put artifacts like that back on display. So thank you very, very much. Fabulous. Hi everybody, I'm Shelby DeYoung. I'm the membership and outreach coordinator my friendly voice is on the other end of the phone. I'm um, taking all your donations. I got to talk to every single one of you, sometimes multiple times, which we really appreciate. Um, anytime you guys called, it felt like talking to an old friend, and I could tell just how passionate you were about what we're doing here and what Scott's doing. Um, his videos have been such a help to many of you. You say you try to fix up your machines on your own if it's a small thing, um, just by following Scott's tutorials. So that's awesome that he can provide that for you. Um, like I said, I am the membership coordinator, so if you want to be a part of our organization and get information, um, we do a newsletter quarterly, so just give me a call and I can get you signed up for that, and then you can talk to me more often and hear what's going on here all the time. <laughs> well, and, and like I shared with you in one of the premieres, she is formerly from Michigan, so... Yes! <laughs> I don't know... Yes, when, yeah, you talked to Roz. Roz is yeah. a Michigan gal, too, so that's cool. Hi there, I'm Marilyn Thompson. I'm the marketing director here at the History Museum. And what I can tell you is, is that those half million items in our collections help us to tell stories of people. People like those who lived right here in Kapsha home. People like those who worked making those cabinets at Singer. And people like you. Um, each of you has your own history, and those are the stories that make it so special for us. So because of your generosity, we can continue telling those stories through the artifacts here at the museum, and we will be grateful for you, to you for always and ever. Thank you. That's awesome. And like I said before, kind of like uh, with Mindy from Las Vegas, um, even, even though all of you obviously brought a significant impact, the, the need and the expenses of running an operation of this size, they don't change. Uh, there's opportunities to continue to support. So, you know, if, if all of a sudden you're blessed with extra money and you're just like, what do I do with this money? What do I do with this money? Kind of like I joked with Mindy, you know, I said, yeah, you would get that extra money and you're just like, but you know whether it, you know whether it's a tax return or whatever it is, or even as you do your estate planning, um, what a great thing it would be to in your estate planning to keep the history museum itself in Indiana in mind, and look at an opportunity of uh, of setting aside part of your estate to help this mission continue as well. And I know many of you, uh, like I said before, it's not 
it's not equal giving. It's equal sacrifice. So all of you, while you gave sacrificially, there's still that opportunity if something happens on your end that all of a sudden you've got extra money and you're, and you're willing to be generous again, reach out to Shelby, uh, reach out to the museum and uh, make another donation. I think that would be super cool. So, all right. Well, let me, let me real quick before I present this uh, neat artifact to Kat and uh, Christy, do a little bit of trivia. Again, it's a classroom, so I wanted to give you guys a little bit of trivia on Scotland. Some trivia that you might not know. And I won't quiz our friends behind us because they, this is an open book. So. <laughs> so many of you might not know this, but Scotland, again, the roots of J.D. Oliver, is the home to the tallest waterfall in Britain. And it's actually 658 feet tall, three times the height, and many of you have been to this place, three times the height of Niagara Falls, if you can imagine. And a lot of you will talk about my unicorn sewing machines. They're the best in the world, right? Well, it so happens in Scotland, the official animal of Scotland is the unicorn. See how this all ties together? Isn't it weird? And many of you didn't know. I certainly didn't know until I looked this stuff up because I didn't just know it. Scotland has approximately 790 islands that are uh, around that beautiful uh, country. Scotland is also the home to the oldest tree in Europe. It's called the Twisted Yew, and it's been around for 3,000 years. What else? I think I'll just give you one more. I don't want to give you all of these. This is always interesting because you always, you know, you kind of cross-pollinate Scotland and Ireland, right? You listen to some music and you go, oh, that sounds like Irish, but it's actually Scottish. Then you listen to Scottish music and you say, oh, that sounds like it's Irish. Well, it so happens that the highest proportion of redheads in the world are in Scotland, not Ireland. So, sorry, if you're from Ireland and you said, hey, we, got, we can claim that, not anymore. Not anymore. So, a little bit of trivia if you're ever on a program and... You can win a lot of money that you could then donate to the History Museum. <laughs> All right, so I think what I'll do is invite uh, Christy and Kat to come out now, if that's okay. Change my shot just a little bit. Where do you like us to stand? Yeah, just somewhere in the middle. Here, turn the screen around that we can see kind of the way I have it angled a little bit. So during this campaign, Doc, Doc Roger from New Mexico, really a neat guy. He and his wife, they'll go all over the country in their RV. He's a retired uh, MD. And they'll go all around the country in their RV, and they'll have two or three sewing machines in the RV, and they'll do all kinds of projects. If they're at a campground and someone tears their pants or something like that, they're Johnny on the spot to say, hey, we can fix that. But he knowing how passionate I was about the cause here at the History Museum and how motivated I was for my pocket to be going off during this premiere. I think that happened to Christy when we were meeting, which is a hoot. Sorry about that. Someone calling to donate more. <laughs> Wait, hello? Yeah, let me hand you to Brian. Hold on a second. Yes. Uh, so at any rate, knowing how passionate I was about this, Doc, I didn't know where he got this. I have no idea. But he was online somewhere and he saw this original postcard that apparently was sent from South Bend, Indiana to Boston, Massachusetts. What did I say, right around 1912? Mm -hmm. yeah. So right around 1912, if you can imagine, this person presumably either had family back in Boston, Massachusetts and or they were from Boston they arrived down here in South Bend. It's the early 1900s. And somehow they've gotten a job at the South Bend Cabinet Factory. And they want to send news back to their family back in Boston or their friends back in Boston. And they write out a postcard with a one cent stamp. And then it gets delivered to those folks and then somehow it makes its way all the way back to South Bend, which I believe is where Doc said he bought it. He bought it somewhere online. But the neat thing about it is, I think, and I may be mistaken, but when Kat and, and Christy had prepared all those artifacts that all of you already saw, which were fantastic, 
Uh, we looked at cards similar to this, but they were all cards that Singer would have had that they would have given out maybe when you, you met with them or you came through one of their factories or whatever. But this one was actually stamped by the Postal Service. So when I shared this with all of you in the live chat, I said, you know, let me know that my heart's in the right place. I don't want to keep this. I want to give it to the History Museum so that when other people come to see Kat and Christy down in that little room where you need to wear gloves, that they would be able to show this to them and say, yeah, this is going to be donated uh, on behalf of uh, Doc Roger and in memory of, and Roz, you don't know this yet, but you've been such a, a great supporter of what I do. Uh, you've sent me more machines than I can count all my toes and fingers. And so in honor of your dad, who came from Indiana, um, Ernest E. Roos, Jr. of Hobart, Indiana, I'm going to present this to Christy and Kat in your dad's memory. And then also it's going to be donated on behalf of Doc Roger. And they're going to tell me, I'll oh, sign here, do this, and cross that, you know, dot this. But the bottom line is I really wanted to turn this over to them because they are the keepers. They are our army of champions that are preserving history. And they can do that a lot better than in my dusty workshop. So, ladies. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Roger. And um, just so you know, whenever this is on display, it will say uh, that it was, you know, gift of Doc Roger in memory of Roz. Your father's name will be there with the credit line uh, anytime it's on display. Amazing, amazing. And I never saw this coming. I mean, it's just people just do incredibly kind things, kind of like all of our heroes. They just step out of the shadows and say, count me in, and there you go. So, all right, well, you think, thank you again, ladies. Thank you. So you think we're done, don't you? You're like, okay, I'm gonna sign off now. See you, bye, thank you, everybody. You're like, wait a second, don't we have to pick a name out of the hat? Because we've got all of these donors that contributed different amounts, and again, that $100 donation got you an initial uh, entry. And then uh, for every $50 behind, beyond that, you got another entry. Well, some of our folks got a lot of entries. So between Shelby and myself, we've shaken this steampunk hat, steampunk hat several times. And uh, hopefully they're all mixed up in there. And now I'm going to probably invite Shelby to come out. She, since she printed all of them, I'll reach into the hat, pull out a name. And we'll find out finally who the winner is. Finally who the winner is. And again, the winner... We'll have a choice of what's behind door number one, which is going to be a fully restored Scottish machine. Uh, it could be a Singer 222K, which again has a value of about three to $5,000. Or they can pick behind door number one that is going to be a Singer 201-2, the Rolls-Royce of Singer sewing machines. The same machine, and I'll kind of point, somewhere up there, am I in the right direction? Okay, over there, see? I'm directionally impaired. <laughs> Over there somewhere, right off of the servants' quarters, is that sewing room that Skyler was so kind to let me get up there. It's not usually open. And we found out that the Olivers, with all of their resources, picked a 201-2 to be up in their sewing room as a resource to this, to this household. So that's why I picked that other machine and said, okay, this is what it is. Either go with an uncertain thing or go with door number two when you know you're going to get the same machine that J.D. Oliver and his family used in this incredible uh, building, this incredible st uh, structure, uh, Kapsha home, uh, the Oliver Mansion. Okay, so we're not going to do a drum roll. We're not going to get dramatic, which is amazing for me, I know. I'm just going to grab the hat and ask Shelby if she'll assist me, and we'll reach in there and pull out the name finally. draws because no, no. All, of, all of these are my friends and I couldn't possibly pick one. All right, I grabbed one. And it is, would you like to read the name? No, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> the name I pulled out is Mary from Washington State. Yay. Mary. And I think it would be, uh, I didn't ask Mary, but I think it would be Dig Dignan. Dignan. Uh, did, she, did she pronounce her last name for you? Or? I don't think she, well, she said it when I entered it, but I can't 
Okay. We'll just say okay. Mary. Mary, you know who you are, right? Our good friend Mary from Washington Our, and Oregon. Yes, Ma yes, that's the Mary. Yes. And I can, I can tell you that uh, I already know that with Mary's, all of you were incredibly generous. Uh, but Mary uh, really kind of stepped out there, you know, even donating for a state that she used to live in but doesn't live in anymore because she was like, I finally shut that Scott up and he won't mention Washington State anymore <laughs> and he won't mention Oregon anymore because I've covered those two bases. But I know Mary's desire was, she said, I just wanted to, my motivation, like a lot of you on these boards, my motivation was to support a great cause. My motivation was because I realized that this organization doesn't just talk the talk, they walk the walk. Like Christy alluded to, a lot of their items that are archived and, and those artifacts that they have in storage, a lot of those things were donated. But as I share with many of you, they also stepped out as well, reached into their own pocket for a lot of those uh, vintage sewing machine artifacts. They bought them themselves because they believe that strongly in having you know, a, a good representation of, uh, of that particular uh, space. So I know that Mary's desire, she told Shelby this, she told me this as well. She said, if I win somehow, what I'd like to do is that that prize, whatever that prize was, I'd like to allocate that for another great cause. And we have another great cause coming up as soon as we hit 11,000 subscribers, which is not too far down the road. So we'll figure out what that is. I'll get all of you to chime in and say, okay, what are we going to do now? Maybe you have a museum in your community that's struggling. And maybe we can step into that space and, and somehow use uh, a giveaway at 11,000 subscribers to help with that. Uh, I don't know, we'll, we'll kind of figure that out. But congratulations to Mary again. Uh, it's great to get to this point, isn't it? All of you have been waiting. You keep sending me notes about when is the drawing gonna happen? It's happened. <laughs> Not only that, we finally had a chance to meet all of these people that I've been telling you about and hear from them as well how much your contribution meant, how much it meant to them to have you step out of the shadows into the light and say, count me in. And that really is the good stuff in life when we can help out. And I can only imagine, I, I, I've only heard about how generous and how kind uh, the Oliver family was. Uh, but when we can step out and help somebody, when we can step out and help a neighbor, when we can step into the, you know, into the space of an organization and say, it's tough times right now. It's a pandemic. Other places are struggling. We don't want that to happen to you. And we can make a difference. As, as little as it is, uh, it all adds up in the end. So with that, I'm going to ring the bell and call the class to a close. Okay? So thank you again, Heroes for History. And uh, thank you to the History Museum as well for being our champions out there and safeguarding those incredible artifacts that mean so much to not only South Bend, Indiana, but with the roots of Singer touching the world. They mean a lot to the entire world and certainly to all of you across the U.S. So God bless you guys and stay tuned for more premieres like this where you never know where we'll pop up. And I uh, hope you enjoyed your brief visit to Kopsha Home. Shameless plug, seeing it on screen, even when Skylar and I walk through it, it's nothing like walking through it yourself. So plan your trip to South Bend and, uh, you know, let me know. I'll let the folks know. Maybe they'll say hey to you when you come through, okay? All right, take care. Thank you.